Hey, Heel Squad, it's Kelsey. Happy New Year, happy 2023. We thought that this episode would be a perfect episode to start you off on the right foot this new year. Kendra Scott, who if you don't know who Kendra Scott is, she is a jewelry mogul and she built a billion dollar empire. This woman is amazing and she has insane tips on business and entrepreneurship. So consider this your business and entrepreneurship 101. Take those notes, get ready and let your dreams fly this new year. Think big, dream big. We are rooting for you and we are right there alongside you. Enjoy and oh, please share with a friend or anyone you think could benefit from this video. We love you, Heel Squad. Oh, and last ask, I'm so sorry, but your reviews and your ratings mean the world to us. So if you could rate and review on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify, please do. They seriously bring us so much joy. We love reading them. All right, enjoy the show. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. That's what we do here every single day. Our quote of the day, if you dream big, work hard, and treat others with kindness, anything is possible. And that is from our guest, Kendra Scott. Uh, very excited for you guys to hear our conversation today. I'm coming to you, Heel Squad, from uh, Kevin's Connecticut office. Kevin's where Shrine. He- a shrine to me, which is very sweet. Oh, my light wasn't really quite on me. Oh, there we go. Um, there we go. Hey. <laughs> um, so yeah, Kevin has all of me everywhere. So it's kind of awkward for me to be sitting here, but my internet connection was a little better here today. So we decided to come to you from here. Um, super, super excited for you guys to hear my chat with Kendra. She's incredible. We chatted about her building a billion that's b with a billion b with a billion with a b b with a billion <laughs> billion dollar jewelry empire and uh of course her philanthropic work that she's doing she's really really um about sharing and and giving back and she's just a really incredible woman so um i'm really glad that we had time to chat today we talked all about her her ranch and our love of animals and nature Um, And I think that if you are interested in kind of diving into the world of entrepreneurship, she is a really great model. She did not go to college for business. She just figured it out. And I think that, you know, that line where there's a will, there's a way very much applies. And, um, you know, it was, it's funny when you talk to young people and they're like, you know, I think this idea will work or you know, this will make a lot of money. And, um, it really, really, if you're going to go into, uh, this world and be an entrepreneur, you really have to love what you're doing. And she explains why in the interview. Um, so without further ado, Kendra Scott is an entrepreneur, philanthropist, and mother. She is the executive chairwoman, designer, and former chief executive officer of the billion dollar jewelry brand, Kendra Scott, where she now sits as president of the company. In 2017, she was named Ernst & Young's National Entrepreneur of the Year. Kendra continues to lead her company on the foundation of three core pillars, family, fashion, and philanthropy. Uh, You guys are really, really going to love her advice. And um, you're going to be blown away at some of the really cool things she has in her company for her employees. I mean, too good. Anyway, I don't want to spoil it or give it away, but... uh, enjoy our conversation. Here's the thing. Obviously you've had so much success with your company. And when you see that you're valued at a billion dollars, like, don't you at some point want to be like, I can do that now. I can go to Italy now and say, peace out everybody. Like, you know, I wait. And why are there more goals? Like, I just am curious and yeah. I know a lot of people would be curious because my dad always says, Maria, how much is enough? Right. I love that. Well, first of all, I love that accent. You know, it's not about a dollar amount, right? I think for me, I feel like I have so much energy and I feel like I have this opportunity to now do a lot of really great things and kind of give back in a big way. And so I feel like I have a lot to do. It's not necessarily, oh, I want to build a bigger business and I want it to be valued at $2 billion. Or I could care less, honestly, about those things. Mm -hmm. For me now, I'm in this next stage of my life after working so hard from the ground up, like struggling to 
pay my rent and you know being a single mom growing a business to where after 20 years of building a business that's now at this stage now I get to do these other amazing things like build a women's institute at the University of Texas to empower other women and you know help with causes that are so important to me and now I feel like wow we could do things that could actually like make a real impact on women and children while I'm alive and I have that opportunity. And if I don't do it, I don't think I could live happily in Italy or anywhere else, right? Yeah. So for me, it's more about that. I just, I'm so excited to get up every day. You know, I lost my stepdad when he was 47 and I'm 47. And I think about that every morning, Maria. And I think about, I had, he wanted to do so much more and I have those breaths in my lungs to be able to do those things. And I think that's what, you know, gets me excited is that that's, that's the drive is we have a very short time on this earth. Mm -hmm. Um, And while we're here, you know, let's make the most of what we can do where we can leave our fingerprint in a positive way. Okay. Two things. One, you're so right about that. Um, I want to go back to the weird thing you said where you said you were 47 because that's just crazy in a second. So Kelsey Pooja, I know you're in here. Just remind me to go back to that crazy oh, thing she said. She said because, that and I said in my head, I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what? what I like hanging out with you all already. Yeah. Like, we're gonna be great <laughs> friends. But we'll go back to this other thing because you keep saying you have so much energy. And for someone who feels like they have very little left, I'm curious, have you ever been burnt out? Yeah. You know, I think, look, there's been a lot of times in life is a series of peaks and valleys. Um, we will have these peaks and then before you know it, something will start happening or someone around us will get sick or someone we love is going through something difficult and you could be at the mm-hmm. highest peak and the next day you could be at the lowest valley, not even expecting it to happen. And I think those moments sometimes are the ones that you just feel like, okay, h- how could you go from this place of waking up the day before feeling so amazing about life and where things Mm -hmm. are going. And in one day, and sometimes can be that quick, you feel like everything has been swept out from underneath you. And I think 2020 for me, honestly, Maria was one of those years that I kept it just a series of things. My dad was very ill. He suffered multiple heart attacks. I was in the hospital with him, you know, a lot. I went through a divorce Uh, I mean, it was like my business, then the pandemic hit, I had to close 120 stores. You know, it was, and every day I'd wake up and I'd say, it can't get any worse. (laughs) (laughs) It can't get any worse. It's got to only get better. And then I had to have an emergency surgery in the same hospital that my dad is checked into for his heart attack. We're both in the hospital at the same time, Maria. I mean, what? For real. He had to, they wheeled him down in a wheelchair to come visit me while I was getting surgery. So it was one, you know, when I think about those things, it's, you know, you go through some, sometimes you think how much more can you handle? And I'm also trying to be a bright light for my children, for my employees who were also suffering during the pandemic, as we were trying to navigate the future of a retail business and making sure that they felt that I was there for them. And I do remember there are a few days just feeling like, I don't know if I can handle this. Like, I don't know if I have that strength that I always felt like I had because it was just constant of one thing after another. And I think that's where I really realized, you know, where we started to really focus on mental health in our company too, is that I wasn't alone. You know, we had a lot of moms at home that were struggling, uh, trying to teach their kids. And I really started to open up conversations of saying, you guys, look, I'm, I was very transparent. I'm going through a rough time. Um, And I let people around me know it to where before I'd always just kind of like, I got this. I'm going to put on a happy face. Even if I'm struggling, I'm going to put on this, like, I'm going to be okay. I'm not, I'm going to hold it in. And 2020 was so hard that I finally just had to say, you guys, I'm suffering. 
and this is a really hard year. And I am, I, you know, and I'm, I, I need help. I need my friends. Uh, I need my family. I need people around me and I needed to be honest and open and it was okay to be vulnerable. And once I showed that vulnerability, then others could feel like they could also be vulnerable. And it really raised our awareness of how important it is to, to be okay with being open about when you're struggling. And so um, that gave me amazing strength is that we were kind of, you know, you form a group around you of love and support and to know that you can't, you're not one, I wasn't, I'm not Wonder Woman. Mm -hmm. And I even was open and honest with my children. You know, I've got um, older boys as well that are, one's just turned 20 and one is 17. And being able to say to them, you know, I'm struggling too right now, mom, you know, and, and I haven't ever, I've always been the one that's like, no matter what, I'm going to wipe my tears away and I'm going to be the, uh, smiling for them. And when I was able to do that with them, we really started to even have a more dynamic, open, really, really heartfelt conversation. And it was a different layer of closeness that my sons and I went through during that year because we were all just real. And sometimes real isn't happy or pretty or all those things. So, um, you know, I think when people look at someone like, oh, she's got all these things and she's this and she's that, she's so happy all the time. And I think it's really important for people to say that's not everyone, everyone. And not every day. Not every day. No, but everyone will go through painful times in their life, loss, divorce, you know, business failure, whatever it might be. Right. And we can't go tackle those things alone. And, and it's OK to say, like, I'm not, you know, I'm not doing all right today. Yeah. Wow. I had no idea you were going through all of that. <laughs> It was crazy. <laughs> Isn't it wild though, when you look back and you're like, I mean, I keep hearing the song in my head. I'm still standing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause it's like, how the fuck am I still standing after everything? Cause I've gone through so much in the last five years. And then just this last year, like this time last year, I had two parents in the hospital with COVID separate hospitals, both immune compromised. It was a real challenging time. And so, you know, you, and then you say the same thing in your head. I, I don't think I can handle more. And then more comes and more yes. comes and more comes. And you're like, okay, I guess I can. All right. Yep. Mm -hmm. I can, I can. And we, we really don't give ourselves enough credit for how resilient we really are. We always will paint this picture of, oh, there's just no way I would survive that, that I would never survive. And you just see humans survive the unsurvivable every day. So what were the keys for you? Because that's a lot business, personal and health. Yeah. I mean, it's, you got the full whammies. Yeah. How did you yeah. get through that time? What were the, like, if you had to advise someone who's in a similar situation, I know you said surrounding yourself yeah. with people and being vulnerable, but were there other actions that you took? I had to, you know, I couldn't say yes to everything. I liked, I hate letting people down. And when people ask me to do something, I always want to try to do it. And I realized that year that I had to, to just really say no to some things, which were hard or to pass things along to other people and let them manage those things. And also just take that time for myself and one of the things I really got into was yoga, which sounds just like, not like it would be that life-changing, but it was life-changing for me because I'm like, move the minute I wake up, I'm go, go, mm -hmm. go, go, go. And I don't stop. And I hardly take a breath and doing yoga for me was like all the things like I felt healthier physically, but then just breathing and stopping for 45 minutes to an hour every day. I can't tell you that one simple thing could have made such an impact for my whole day. Um, and so that really like, and that was something I never thought I'd get into. Cause I was like, if I'm not working out at this high level intensity, then I'm not really getting a workout. And if I'm going to do an hour, I got to do it like full on, you know, I've got to be throwing tires around or something, you know? <laughs> and I, I finally, you know, somebody was like, just try it, just try it. Kendra. I'm like, Oh, yoga, whatever. And I did. And I'm like, why have I waited all of my life to do this? And, you know, even physically, like I felt stronger and all those things. So that was huge. And then I think also understanding that I needed to let things go. And, you know, my uh, president at the time who'd been with me for seven years, I was like, you know, the day-to-day -day business things, I really feel like this is a great time to pass that baton, to let you take over the CEO role and allow me to focus on things after 20 years in the CEO seat 
to step back and, and focus on the things that I really feel I can propel, not just the business forward, but our legacy of what I want to leave behind from a philanthropic standpoint. And also I have a little boy, I have an eight-year-old to have this opportunity to enjoy these years before he becomes a teenager, like my older boys, um, was important to me too. And, and that was a big step. I don't think if all of those things hadn't come at me at one time, I would have just been trying to do everything and continue to do everything and, you know, be a little harried. And I really just being honest and, and saying this is the right time uh, was huge. And I feel like the sense of every day I wake up and I, I have so many things I'm excited about doing. And obviously I'm still the, you know, majority shareholder of Kendra Scott. I'm the chairwoman. I'm the head lead designer. I'm doing all the things. I really have it like when I say step back, it's not really step back, but I'm also allowing some of the things that you know, I was making every single decision on every single thing every day. Now it's like, I have a great team that I've built over 20 years and I respect and trust them. And I have them in these seats and positions because they're amazing. And they're so good at what, I mean, great at what they do. Um, so, and they get it, they get the brand, they understand what we're doing. And it's really been nice to be able to kind of let, like, just say, Hey guys, you know, we got this together and, and have a little bit, you know, like, I don't need to do all of it. Yeah. It's big. It's big. Yeah. <laughs> Why is legacy so important to you? Uh, I mean, I think for me, after losing my stepfather to brain cancer, I was, you know, him being so young. I know for him, he just he felt like he wished he had time to do more to leave behind. And he, when he was suffering with cancer, you know, he got to a point where he would have difficulty forming sentences. And, um, but he could understand everything you were saying to him. And he was a two-time Vietnam veteran, a Purple Heart recipient. He spoke five languages fluently. So for him not to be able to speak one language, you know, broken was so frustrating for him. But my first business was a hat company. And I started it because he uh, had lost his hair. And I'd met so many women that had lost their hair with chemotherapy while he was going through treatment. And so I started a hat company where I was sewing cotton linings and hats uh, for women who, you know, so they'd be more comfortable and soft on their heads. And I had loved fashion since I was a little girl. And he said to me, Kendra, if you can do what you're passionate about, but also do something good at the same time, then you're going, like, that's your life's purpose is, mm. you know, we're all given different gifts and talents, but how do we take those gifts and talents and then also like do something good that we can like really empower people, right? And, and and make a change for the better. And so fashion was my way to do that. And so the little hat company was where I could see when I'd hand a hat to someone and see how happy they made them and how beautiful they felt when they put it on and, and confident um, that I was using a skill to do something good. Uh, and so I think legacy for me is, is just that. It is the ability to build something now that I'm teaching others, mentoring others, the ability to not only empower them to be their best selves, you know, showing women that it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter if you don't have the best education in the world, or if your parents aren't Rockefellers, you know, you can be an owner of a billion dollar brand, but not just that, because it's not about money. It's about then you get this opportunity to like, do things that can change the world for the better. How cool is that? And so for me, it's like that has been the reason I've built this business from day one was I wanted to build something and use the gifts I was given to make a difference in the world. It was never about me being this fashion, you know, whatever. It was more about I love fashion and design. Now, how can I take that and really do something good while I'm here? So when we talk about the valuation and all those things, those are great, but I'm more excited that we've given $40 million to women and children's charities. I mean, I'm looking at our give back dollars way more than I look at anything else. And wow. that's what kind of drives us. I mean, we're kind of a philanthropic organization in a for-profit company. So it's different it. than when you think about different brands. This is very different on how we kind of work here. So legacy is everything to us at Kendra Scott. I mean, we, we're we wanting to build something that is going to be here generations uh, that are going to empower women and help them with their education and health far beyond when I'm here, my children were here. Hopefully my grandchildren and great grandchildren will be able to be a part of continuing that legacy. So cool. 
I love that. And I love, I love that that was like how it all kind of started. So you went from the hat company, that was kind of a challenge. Um, and then you got interested in jewels. So um, tell us a little bit about kind of how you transitioned into jewelry and, and, you know, whatever kind of nuggets you can throw in there for somebody who has an idea and wants to run with it because it's, it's something that seems so unattainable and challenging, right? Like I liken it to like when I was growing up and I was dreaming about being on TV and it just seems so unattainable. And then I saw John Stamos on TV. I'm like, he's Greek. <laughs> If he can do it, I can do it. Right. Um, but there is, but in Hollywood, there is no kind of like formula, right? Yeah. If you want to be a doctor, there's a formula. If you want to be an entrepreneur, there really is kind of a formula. You just have to be okay with failing a lot. I feel like. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So yeah, any nuggets you can give. So anybody who's listening can, you know, can feel like they're, they're learning along the way, learning the Kendra way. Yeah. You know, I think first of all, you've got to love what you're doing. If you're doing something just to make money, I'm going to tell you right now to stop doing it. And I know that sounds like what this is, you know, we're in this world where, you know, we, everyone thinks about, Oh, we want to be rich. We want to have a nice car. We have a nice house. But at the end of the day, I promise you, if you're just doing it for money, you're going to be miserable and unhappy. And it's not probably going to survive if you're starting a business, because there are going to be so many difficult times that if you don't have the passion and the love for what you're doing, you're you're not going to get out of those ugly valleys like we talked about earlier and get to your next peak because you don't, the passion's what's going to get you out of there and that excitement for what you love to do. So that's one. Two, I would say, you know, with the hat business, I was so focused that the hat thing had to work that I was making jewelry for my store and that was selling the day I put it out on my little counter. But the hats, you know, I'd be like, I went, so I would sell like a hat a day or whatever. Now hats are like a big, much bigger deal. So I was way ahead of my time, Maria, but you were, um, I know, but I didn't see what was working because in my brain, I was like, I've got, I'm going to open hat stores and it's going to be the hat mm-hmm. thing. And so I would say to anybody thinking about starting a business when you're in it, sometimes you got to have to like have that 360 approach and be okay to pivot and be agile that maybe there's something in there that's really working, but maybe what you thought was going to be the main thing might not work. And that's okay. And sometimes putting that to bed and, you know, I had to fail, I failed, I closed that store and customers kept calling me for the jewelry, not hats. And so it was forcing me to continue to make jewelry. And I was kind of like, Uh, Hello, Kendra. Maybe there's something here to this jewelry business. Um, So that would be two. And then the last thing I'd say is you've got to put, you've got to be disruptive. If you're doing what everyone else is doing, you've already failed. So, you know, if you're like, I want to make jewelry that looks like X, Y, and Z, the same people, you're going to be just one of a million. So you have to do something disruptive. Um, You've got to put your own unique fingerprint on things. And otherwise, there's no point in doing it, right? So really looking at your competition and thinking about, One, what's out there and what do people really want? What do you want that you can't find? What do you need that you can't find? Because nine times out of 10, there's a lot of people that feel the same way that you do. So I think that's super important. And then know that, you know, you're not going to be able to do this alone. No one can be the best CEO, CFO, uh, product developer, planner, all those things. So eventually you have to build a winning team. And be really honest with yourself on what you're great at, but more important, be honest on what you suck at, because you need to hire people that are great at the things that you suck at, right? (laughs) So I think sometimes, you know, when you entrepreneur, you can get that, like, I can do it all, cannot do it all, um, and be really honest and open and hire awesome people that are smarter than you, that are, and when I say smarter, that doesn't mean that you're not smart, just saying, hey, when it comes to Excel spreadsheets, I am not good at them. I need somebody who doesn't does those way better and can handle that. Now I like to read them, but I don't want to have to put one together. So, you know, it was, it was things like that, that I think can really help somebody when they're starting a business and, you know, look, get a mentor. That's my biggest piece of advice. Not just one, if you can find more than one, um, I am running a business every single day. That's bigger than it was the night before. And so I'm in uncharted territory every morning. And so I have amazing mentors that have run businesses that have built bigger businesses than mine that I call and I'll say, hey, we're going through this right now. What are your thoughts? Do you have a few minutes? I'd love to get your take on this. I'm I'm always wanting to be a sponge. I want to learn um, constantly. 
And I now get to mentor other young entrepreneurs who are, you know, because I've already traveled that road they're walking on. And so I think having mentors that you respect and they don't have to be in your field. They could be in different businesses, but they how they run their business, how they treat their people, how they, uh, you know, reach out to their community. All those things matter. So finding good mentors will get you a long, long way in business. Yeah. And I like the advice of even people who aren't in your business because they'll be able to look at it a little differently and yes. give you something that somebody else might not have. Um, and, and the idea of pivoting, not being so rigid and stuck on something, but you know, in terms of hiring people, when you are a small business and I know you were that at one point, yeah. how do you hire the best when you can't afford the best? What tips well, I think, do you have for that? Yeah, I think, it, okay, initially there were seven of us for a long time. Um, now we've got over 3,000 employees across the country. I will say over 95% women, by the way, mm-hmm. which is pretty cool. Uh, but and initially it was, I hire on heart. I know that sounds so crazy. We do the but, same thing. Kevin says yes. all the time, hire for heart, train for skill. Yes, yes. You can train skills, but you can't train that heart, that love, that, you know, that just that being a good, thoughtful, kind person. Those were, that was super important to me. And people that had passion, if they were excited about it. So I think about like, you know, I was hiring design assistants first because I couldn't make all my samples. It was out of like necessity. You know, I was making everything myself out of my extra bedroom of my house (laughs) and, you know, I needed help. I couldn't, I couldn't do all of that. So it was like a production assistant. Then it was a design assistant. Then I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to go to market. I, I mean, so I was bringing like some of these people were then going to market and they were designers with me and we were selling at the Javits Center. We were, I mean, we were doing all these different things within the organization. And so finding people that have that flexibility to wear a lot of hats in the beginning is really Mm -hmm. great. Then you're going to get to a point where you're starting to see things increase and you have to make that pivotal decision of, I need to hire some really good experienced folks. And those are going to cost me a little more money. When I hired my first COO, um, it was 10 years into the business and um, I had to take my salary down to almost nothing to hire him. And I remember our controller saying, Kendra, we can't afford him. And I said, we can't not afford him. You've got to invest some time. So we're investing in machinery or we're investing in manufacturing or investing in various things, but investing in people in those key growth stages is probably one of the most important things you can do uh, when you're running a business. And that has been pivotal as, you know, from then to now, we went from seven employees to 3000. We went from, you know, a million and a half dollars to now we're valued over at a billion, you know, dollars. So think about the amount of people that we've been hiring, but it's still on heart. I mean, they can bring in a gold plated resume, Maria. And if they're not nice or they seem a little, I'm like, you're not going to be able to work here. Like we just, it's not going to work. I've got to understand and I agree. Right. (laughs) Right? Got it. I mean, but, but when you walk in our stores, when you walk in our offices, you just feel that it's, it's not this, you know, bitchy fashion. It's like these kind people rooting for one another. You know, we have mother's nursing rooms. We've got, you know, babies in the office, kids running around on scooters, you know, with the ch- children's play area. We've got yoga oh, in the lawn. Like it's this environment that is just loving and supportive. Um, and, you know, that's something that I think I'm probably most proud of what we've developed here for sure. That's so cool. I love it that. Fun. We have a nail salon too. So if you come, you can get your nails done. It's And then that's complimentary if you work here. Wait, that's genius. <laughs> that is the hardest thing for women to keep up with is getting your nails done. And unfortunately, yes. we live in a time where it's like kind of a necessity. You can't. Well, not. and we sell jewelry. So we want our finger, fingers to look nice. And we never, I have never have time. So this, all these perks are coming from a mother of three who is always running around like a crazy person. I'm like, what would make, what would make me so happy is if we had a smoothie bar and a nail salon. So I could have something that I'm not starving at three o'clock when I'm ready to fall apart. I need a healthy oh smoothie. Goodness. And we need nails. And so I'm like, we're giving this complimentary to all employees so that they can go. They'll have meetings, getting pedicures, like with their laptops sitting next to each other. It's amazing. It's 
it's like a woman's utopia here. I love that. You know, when we built After Buzz, my husband put in like laundry machines. So our host, because he knew everyone's like burning the candle at both ends. It's so hard to get their laundry done. So we would have our laundry machines there for them. And, you know, we made it an environment where it felt kind of like a bar. So people could like feel like they had a night out and it was like a cool thing. So everybody, well, certain people I know in certain companies try to give some kind of atmosphere for their employees so that they feel um, taken care of. I love the nail salon. I'm totally (laughs) going to steal that someday. But I also think, um, I think, you know, the, the hiring is always, you know, kind of like the hardest thing is how do you find the right people? And, um, and that's always challenging, but I I love where you set an example. You're like, I'm I, I have to do this and I'm not going to take a salary. And I've done that myself where it's like, nope, nope. We yeah. got to put money somewhere it, else if you're going to try to go right. for it. But I think too, you know, one of the things people say, well, how did you find these people? And in the earlier days, I would just tell anyone I knew that might be connected in any way to any business people or, you know, whatever, what I wanted, like my dream COO, what he would look, he or she would look like, you know, what, what their personality would be, what they were really good at things that they might've done in their past lives of of business, whatever. And literally one of those people that I would just, it's kind of like when you, you know, look for like the man of your dreams, you tell your friends, I want a guy who's like this, this, right. We write down all the things we want. When you're thinking about how hiring key people in your organization, it's like write your dream person down and then share it because the world can't read your mind. So, you know, if we want things to happen, we got to put it out there and we've got to, and we've got to let people see it. Um, Same thing with like building our company. Like we do a painted picture of every three years, what we want. And that includes not just like, you know, how many stores and, you know, sales and things like that, but it's like, we put a vision of building this women's institute for other women, young women to teach them leadership and entrepreneurial mindset and give that to all women, not just women that were in the business school. We wanted women who were in you know, edu- any field, right? And that became a reality because we put it out there and we could all see it and we could see what that could look like. And then we could build the roadmap on how to get there. And people, as since we knew that's what we were looking for, and we would talk about it, we'd have people call us, well, I heard you're going to be doing this thing, or you might be doing this thing. How do we get involved? How do we help with that? And all of a sudden, we started getting all of these great people to help us build something that was really just a dream. Um, And I think that's such an important thing when you're looking for hiring um, or anything in your life, really, is to really think of, like, close your eyes and really think about what does this look like? Or what does this person look like? And then tell everybody you can and hope that you know, someone will call you one day and say, Hey, you know, I met this person who just is looking for something that might be a right fit. Um, and that's that. usually how you find the greatest people or potentially a boyfriend, you know, it works either way. You're telling your <laughs> friends and the universe, which yes. one, of, one or the other will deliver. Yes, yes. I want to ask you, because at the beginning of this, you said that, you know, you're building this, this institute and and doing all of this kind of like giving back to the young entrepreneurs because you want them to know no matter what their background, their parents were Rockefellers, they can do this. They can build a business like this. So did you go to business school? <laughs> no, I'm a college dropout, Maria. Um, proudly. Sure. I went, I got a master's degree in the school of hard knocks. I'm not, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but um, no, you know what? I, my stepfather was sick uh, when I was in high school. He, he was diagnosed with brain cancer and my whole world kind of shifted. I, so I ended up taking, t- I was going to just take time off after my freshman year of college to, I was at MD Anderson with my mom a lot. And I really wanted to focus on that year of just being there. We knew that he was, you know, struggling at that point. And my intention was to always go back. And then at 19, I started this hat business uh, motivated by, you know, what I was living through. And I really did. I thought, well, I'll start this and then I'll go back. I'll go back. And then five years, I'm running this little hat company and just trying to make it work, working seven days a week. Like it was not working, but I was like, this is going to work. Um, and I wanted to do so. I, but then I lost my stepfather. And so it was like, this business for me was more than just a business. It was like, I wanted to do this for him too. And so I think, you know, that's, it's hard when you go through things like that because you're like, oh my God, and then you fail at it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, 
it's, it was a really trying, I think, time, but at the same time, it's like, it led me to this. So that hat box was my education. Um, I never got back to school, but that little store running it seven days a week, paying my rent, trying to figure out overhead, understanding what margins look like. If I hadn't gone through that, I wouldn't have built the business I have today. And it was my bridge that I needed to get me to where I am. And there was no amount of business education that I could have ever gotten at a university that would have given me the skill set to be able to really understand what I needed to do to build the successful business today. So I think we, we all have these visions. We go to high school, we go to college, we get a good job. This is the path, right? And my path got derailed because of a personal family issue but it was exactly where I needed to go. Um, it was exactly the track I needed to get on uh, for where my future was going to lead me. And I think if we can sometimes embrace those moments and say, there might be a reason that this is happening to me right now. And even with the failure of the hat box, I look back and I think it, I think that every day that that happened, because if it hadn't, I would not be sitting here with you today. I would not be doing the things that we're doing. I needed that time there and I needed that failure to be where I am today for sure. So for me, that was the best education I could have. Now, later I just said, you know, I do want to learn more because my business was growing and I didn't go to business school. So I took a entrepreneurial master's course through um, entrepreneurs network uh, organization. And they bring in 65 students to MIT for a, a three year, you go for like a long, you know, like a week each year. And then you do all this stuff throughout the year. And I did that from 2006 to 2009, right during the recession. Uh, and it was so great because I was able to learn from other entrepreneurs uh, who had started businesses and really gave just solid advice on things that I needed to learn. So I think we can always have continued education. I don't think it mm -hmm. ends with college or a master's, or it may not even be typical. It may yeah. be on, you know, internships. It may be taking other course, just other courses uh, that interest you. So, you know, I always even say to my kids, don't feel like you have to do it exactly this way. I'm um, sometimes following your heart, but also really thinking about like, what are the things that you want to learn? Because it may not just be available in a typical university. Yeah, I think you're such an example for life is happening for you, not to you. Mm -hmm. Like, if you think about that, you know, the stuff with your stepdad and, you know, the hat box not succeeding, but the jewelry. And then, you know, <laughs> even just this last year, everything that you went through so that you could step down but yeah. step up in other ways, you could have looked at it like, oh my God, I can't handle everything. And, you know, everything's falling apart instead, like life is happening for you. Yes. Um, and I, I love yeah. hearing that story. And I, I know you also took jewelry classes when the jewelry was starting yes. to kind of kick off. You wanted to learn more about that, but I think it's so inspirational for people to see that even when you don't have the background, you can figure it out and I wonder in those kind of like initial, initial days, you know, you're building a jewelry business and you said the biggest thing you learned were, was about margins. Can you talk about that? <laughs> well, I mean, I learned that first of all, retail is the hardest business out there. Uh, you know, running a brick and mortar retail store was really difficult. And I was buying from other designers. Um, and so I was, you know, the margin between what I was able to buy from a wholesale price point and then retail, and then thinking about your rent and your overhead and your employees and all the other things, there wasn't enough margin there for me to be able to be successful. Um, and so I really felt like one, I didn't want to be in retail because that's scary. Also, it was super scary. You had to, and I'm saying this now from a girl who has 125 retail stores. So this is where, when I say pivot and be agile and be flexible with your hard <laughs> nose, things will change throughout your life. Yeah. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, well, because I, the, the brick and mortar is not to interrupt, but the brick and mortars end up becoming like marketing and advertising at this point, I think, right? Oh, amazing. Yes. And I, yeah. brick and mortar is, is more alive than ever. I'm going to say it uh, where everybody, we, you know, last year was like, it's dead and no one's going to go into stores anymore. People cannot wait to get into stores right now and see people and shop and that community. Um, people need human touch. 
we, I love that we can meet like this, but I cannot wait, Maria, we can sit and be together in, in, in Tuscany, Tuscany you, right? In Tuscany, <laughs> right. Um, so, I mean, we need human touch. We need that yeah. connection. We need community. And so we can find those things in these places, right? And so for our stores, for me, it's all about connection. It's not about necessarily selling. It's about people coming in, experiencing the brand, experiencing the joy, having fun in the store, being with their friends, attending a Kendra Gives Back event for a charity that they love. Like it's about community. And I think if businesses kind of thought about retail that way, it'd be a totally different thing, right? And we have since the beginning. So that's different. Um, Going back, I'm trying to remember where we were, but I was afraid to open retail. I thought if I just designed and manufactured and Other stores came in and wrote the orders like I did when I had my little hat box store. I'd ship it and then I would never have to worry about it again. And that would be great. And, you know, that that, that's how I want to do. I want to be on the other end of this because I was on the other side. So I thought I'm going to manufacture and wholesale. And so that's really how I started. And when I started, Maria, I did not scream from the rooftops that I was starting a jewelry company. After the failure of my first business, I didn't want to tell anybody I was starting a business. Um, I was just doing it kind of like if I can make enough money to help with, you know, my family and I had a newborn baby, you know, it would be great because I was also afraid like people would be like, oh, you know, yeah, here she goes. She's already a failure. Let's see how she does with this one. I was so worried about that, that I was just quiet about it. And then as things started to move and I was just like, I started to realize, you know what, maybe I have something here. And again, my good friends, the people in my life were the ones that were like wearing it, telling everybody about it, you know, and they became like, and I'm like, you guys, you know, I'm not like really like making a big deal about it yet. And they are like, why not? This is amazing. (laughs) Why are you telling everybody? Uh, They became like the ones telling everybody. And so the business was, you know, started to kind of grow organically. But for almost eight years, I did not do retail. I just did manufacturing and wholesale to other stores. So we had been, we had some great accounts like Nordstrom and some others as well. So that was great um, until the recession hit. And it forced me again, life happening. What what was your, I got to write this down and put it in my thing. Oh my God. It's my literal, it's my mantra for life. Life is happening for you. For you. you. Yes. So life happens for me. I mean, no, I can't. I'm putting it in my office. Life happened for me in 2008 with the recession. And people would say, what? It was one of the worst economic crises of our time. You that That's a gift. And it was the greatest gift Kendra Scott, the company has ever gotten because it forced me to say, I mean, our wholesale partners were closing stores daily that I was writing orders for. Buyers that I had worked with were getting laid off at the department stores that I had built relationships with. All of my eggs were in one basket. And I was so worried about the buyers and the store owners for all those years. I forgot who the most important person was. It was my customer. And I knew I had to go direct to consumer. I had to talk to her directly. And what is the best way to do that? open a store, really build our e-commerce so that we could connect with her, really build our social media platform so I could hear what she wanted, what she needed. And in 2009, we really refocused the business to a direct-to-consumer, still, of course, having our wholesale customer base. But everything in, in our company was, if we make the customer happy. It doesn't matter what happens in wholesale because they're going to ask for our products. They're going to want Kendra Scott in the stores. I've got to make her happy. Uh, And that really changed the whole direction of, of where we went. And that's when we started to see this lightning in a bottle growth was from 2010, you know, to today. Um, and it would not have happened. I was just kind of going along. We were growing, but not growing huge. It was safe. And then the recession hit and it shook up the snow globe and it forced me to have to look at things differently. And it also made me create a better business. The pandemic, same thing. I mean, this was my 2020 plan in March. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, that's out the window. Let's start over. <laughs> you know? And we had to like get whiteboards out at my house, six feet apart, masks on and like figuring out, you know, my, my uh, CEO and I figuring out like what we're going to do as we're zooming our board members in of like, okay. And it forced us to do things that we may not have done and create better service like curbside pickup and virtual try-on and all of these cool things we had out there that we wanted to implement. 
in the future. We brought it up right to today and our customer was so happy. Um, and so, you know, I think we look at those things, like you said, and you could just go, oh God, this is going to fit. I mean, there's no way we're getting out of this. Or it's like, okay, let's, let's just see what, let's see what works. Let's, you know, and this may not work, but at least we're moving one foot in front of the other. Yeah. Um, you, you know, even, and, and that's the thing I was telling my team, it's okay if we were moving and something doesn't work, but if we just are afraid to do anything because we're afraid it won't work, we're never going to move forward. You've got to paint the train while it's moving. <laughs> the train while it's moving. Yeah. We're pretty good at that. All we do is paint <laughs> trains while they're moving. They're moving yeah. fast. <laughs> I was I'm like, I don't know many people that can keep up. We're pretty crazy. <laughs> um, I love this. I think, I think you're just so great, Kendra. You have such great wow. energy, such a great spirit. Um, it's no coincidence that you have succeeded so wildly and that you're giving so much of yourself back. I wonder like personally, what do you do for kind of your, your mental health, your physical health? Like, obviously I know you said yoga, which is great. And, and definitely another kind of moment for me where I'm like, oh, this yoga thing keeps screaming. I probably should try it. Trust me, please do. I got the mirror. I mean, I'm not like advertising for it, but I love it because I got it during COVID and they have mm -hmm. the best classes. And I didn't feel like I was in a class environment where I didn't know the moves and I might not be doing it like yeah. great. So I was by myself and I could see someone and be like, okay, do I look like I'm doing it right? I love that thing. So it, it was great. Um, no, you know, you're going to laugh, but I, um, so I'm engaged. You're the first to hear this officially. It just happened. I know. Um, I'm engaged and my fiance and I have a ranch together and I've been, I am so obsessed with being outside. I, I, my family were farmers, um, you know, growing up, I wouldn't go to the farm every summer and, you know, I'd get up in the mornings with my uncles and get on the combines. And I just, for me being out there planting, I love planting flowers. I love being in, and I love animals. Like I'm an animal freak. So I'm coming to the ranch. <laughs> yes, we have horses. I've got some alpacas. I, um, alpaca. I, I know. I mean, I, we have uh, four dogs. I just rescued an African tortoise last week. I mean, I, I don't, I can't even tell you, I built a tortoise house over the weekend. I mean, we were in the barn building a, a house, retrofitting a dog house for a African tortoise. So, you know, I think for me, I just love being out there at the end. I love feeding them. I love you know, being outside. I love being on our tractor. I mean, you would think here is Kendra Scott, this like, land. those things for me give me so much joy. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to them crazily enough, like just to be out there, be out there with the kids, watching the kids ride the horses or whatever it might be. It's just, for me, it is my place of calm. And I'm just so happy and no makeup, jeans and a flannel shirt and an old worn pair of cowboy boots. And I'm really, really happy. <laughs> Kelsey. I know we we're twins? going. Yeah. You got, well, first of all, I want to go ride all the horses. Second of all, yes, Maria, you guys are twins. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we were separated at birth. Kendra. I love it. Well, you have to come to Austin, please come and come see the animals and we'll go riding and it'll be awesome. Maria likes her lawnmower. That's not a tractor. I but no. <laughs> yes, I have a riding lawnmower. That's what she's Don't talking about. Yes, that's what I mean. It's a big one, but it literally, there's nothing more therapeutic, right, Maria? Well, I, I, I can't believe I'm having this conversation with you because mm -hmm. no one would think looking at you or I, that mm -hmm. our, one of our favorite pastimes is mowing the lawn. Kendra, but it I, is. I am in Connecticut right now. We have 60 acres here. Okay. Yeah. I live to get on the lawnmower and mow the lawn and be outside in nature. I love catching all the frogs and playing with the animals. I mean, I am an animal. You could stick me anywhere as long as there are animals and I'm fed. I just want food. Um, cause when I like we're to be done, I'm going to, well, I'll get yourself. I'm going to text you pictures of my alpacas because those are the animal, the next animals you need in Connecticut. They would so love it up there. I go to the neighbors to play with theirs. Cause I love them <laughs> so much. My neighbors all have animals. So I go to all of them. I have, um, a dog down the street that I'm obsessed with named Bruno. He's a bulldog. I have the alpacas down the street. I got the goats and the sheep, like that we play with on the street. I love animals. I've been an animal lover my whole life, but 
being in nature, like the second I got home here, I stopped grinding my teeth. Yes. I could sleep. I can breathe. Something about being in the woods is so relaxing. We have a pool in the back. When you swim in the pool amongst the woods, yeah, there's no other feeling like it. It's crazy. So I fully understand. And I was telling Kevin recently, I said, you know, I always growing up said someday I'm going to have a zoo and an aquarium. I'm going to save all these animals. And I said to him, I go, I think that really is what's going to make me happy in life. He's like, all right, well, we'll do it. And I go, no, I didn't, yet. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, but it's just will start happening. Like this African tortoise, it would needed rescue. There's a central Texas tortoise rescue. And I don't know how I came about it. I'm like, I wasn't planning on rescuing a turtle, <laughs> a tortoise. Okay. but this thing is so cute. He's so cute. I'm like, oh my God, I love him. So you never know. I mean, it just happened overnight. Kind of like it keeps like my menagerie you know, of like thing, animals that I just, and I love them so much and just brushing the horses, feeding them, watching them eat, like all those things that I just love. I mean, I love it all. And yeah, yeah. like you said, sitting on the patio and you can hear the bugs, yeah. like sound the of the bugs and-, and the wind in the trees. And it's those simple things for me. Like I sit out and I'm just like, oh, instantly. Yeah. Oh, so good. Okay. So now Kelsey, I'm going to tell Kendra some things that are going to probably freak her the hell out. So this is how insane I am. So last summer we drove from, I spoke at a Tony Robbins seminar. We drove up here from Florida to Connecticut and Kelsey was with me and we get here and the house had been a little bit kind of overrun. My parents had been gone for a long time because as you know, my mom was dealing with brain cancer um, how long did your uncle live for, by the way, with my, him? my stepdad, I mean, your my, stepdad, sorry. Yeah. I have... Um, he, so when he was diagnosed from diagnosis, uh, almost seven years. Wow. Yeah. And he had, he had glioblastoma. So he, he I mean, I should know exactly the type of cancer, Marianne. I'm sorry. I don't know if that's, that's okay. Was. His was, they think was formed from agent orange exposure from Vietnam. So uh, he had had a tumor removed and another tumor came back. So we were kind of going through, you know, removing tumor, removing another one, then one form that was just impossible for us to kind of get at. Um, I mean, he had done, we had kind of kept it at bay, you know, at first they did not think he was going to make it more than a year. Um, And so, you know, why I'm so engaged and involved with MD Anderson is because they gave us the gift of time, you know, which is, you know. Um, it was amazing, but he was diagnosed when he was 40. Was it stage four? Uh, it was stage three at diagnosis. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Well, we obviously have that in common as well. So yeah. my mom and dad weren't here. I was like, okay, we'll get it all kind of squared away. Yeah. Well, of course now we're coming across different animals, different things. So there was a, a salamander in the back and he was looking real, real dead. And so oh. I like to resuscitate insects. Yes. I have successfully given chest compressions to and brought back to life from the dead a grasshopper okay. and a cricket. Wow. Very delicate you little insects. Tell me you didn't on. do like mouth to mouth on that. Well, that on the be... salamander <laughs> lizard guy, I was trying to give him mouth to mouth, but like not official. I was like blowing close to his <laughs> like mouth. in a straw. <laughs> yeah. And Kelsey's watching me and she's like, you are cooked. And then there was a snake in the basement, a little snake, like, you know, a little long guy. That That's I right had to, the line. I spoke to him. We, he, we had lots of conversations and then he cooperated with me putting him in the dustpan in the bag, which, you know, how you, how do you get snakes to cooperate? And he said, thank you because so you, he let me pat him when I put him outside by the pool. So basically like, they're like Dr. Doolittle. Yeah. So that's how insane I am with it. I mean, I've, I've rescued and, and men did so many animals since I was little squirrels, raccoons, birds, hummingbirds, all of them, but the yeah. insects are the new ones. So like I yeah. do I everything can, I, I can, can honestly say, I mean, I've, I've done that with a hummingbird that ran, flew into our picture window. I, I resuscitated. I went online. I figured out what to do, but insects, snakes, and rats, that's where <laughs> I draw the line. I mean, and that's where you are <laughs> way better person than me. <laughs> Wait, the best is, um, was there was a rat or like some mouse thing in my backyard. And I was like, Oh no. So I'm, I got a plastic bag and I'm trying to give him chest compressions. And my dad oh God, looking no. at me from the window above Maria, are you crazy? And I go, dad, it's God's creature. We have to help it. Oh Anyhow, my gosh. 
those are my stories. So you're amazing. We'll have ranch no. time. I will share more, but um, <laughs> I am going to let you go because we are at um, at our time. And I'm just so oh, grateful yeah. to. I could you. talk to you all day, all day, and and thank you. This was awesome. Thank you so much. I loved every second of it. All right, Kendra Scott. Ladies, have we learned something or many things? She's amazing. I mean, all her advice. I want to go back and listen to it again, but I really, one of the main things I wrote down that I liked was the be disruptive. Mm -hmm. I think that that's so cool. And I think that right now, you know, with the social media and the TikTok, I think it's so easy to kind of like bandwagon and do what other people are doing. And she's like, no. If What did she say? If you're doing what everyone else is doing, you've already failed. Oh, and I like I agree. I'm like, be original, be you, and don't be scared. And that kind of goes into something else she was talking about, you know, women being scared of being judged. And she finally got over that. And she was just like, you know what? No. So I thought that that was amazing. Um, she's really cool. And you guys had really fun energy together. So I'm excited to go to the ranch. <laughs> yeah, we're going to the ranch. I love the nail salon. I love yeah. the smoothie bar. You know, at After Buzz, we did the laundry machines and we, you know, we did what we could. We had such a small space. Um, you know, we had maybe 12 employees or have some still, but I think at that time, at our highest point, I think we had like 12. So it's a little different than 3,000. But a little. we're getting there. We yeah, have we all the 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 stuff in the in the back burner waiting for the moments but i think the biggest thing that i took is that it doesn't happen overnight yeah. it does take a long long time and you have to grind and you have to really love it to keep fighting for it and so um you know it's 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 a thing and so even with this what we're building here with better together you know her passion is to help female entrepreneurs and my passion is to help people in general, but really with health and wellness and, um, and all of that. And so, um, you know, I think that if your passion is authentic to you and if you are willing to put the work behind it and you're willing to be patient, um, that everything will come and everything will happen. Love you, Hill Squad. All right. Be nice people, make good choices and be present. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or MariaMenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.